In this video, we're going to look at ideas from Chapter 10. In particular, we're going to look at ideas in Section 10.7, which involve the kinetic molecular theory of gases. To begin with, a question for you. At STP, how does an equal volume of helium differ from nitrogen? STP, recall that means standard temperature and pressure. So at standard temperature and pressure, how does an equal volume of helium differ from an equal volume of nitrogen? What's your answer? Explain your reasoning for me. I think the best answer is they have different density. If we think back to our ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT, I think both helium and nitrogen are going to be well defined and fit the description of ideal gases. So under STP and equal volume, I think we're making the same, the pressure, the volume, the temperature, and R is also a constant. So if all of those are the same in each case, they must also have the same number of moles of gas present, the same end value. That doesn't mean that the particles themselves have the same mass. Helium and nitrogen gas, those particular particles or molecules have different masses. So if everything else is the same, they end up with a different density. The idea that they have the same or different average kinetic energy, that's something we're going to explore in this video. The average kinetic energy, this is what the temperature is measuring. So let's see how these ideas come together. Let's see how they come together in what's called the kinetic molecular theory of gases. So we've seen earlier the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law, like other scientific laws, explains a regular pattern that we find in nature. It explains relations, it, it describes relationships involving pressure, volume, temperature, the amount of the gas. It's applicable for different gases again and again. It's describing a regular occurrence and observations that we have seen reproduced again and again. That's what a, a law does. A scientific law is describing that pattern. But it doesn't really give us an explanation for why. The ideal gas law is explained by a scientific theory, the kinetic molecular theory. These are the different features involved in the kinetic molecular theory. This is a description of what the gas is like. Let's explore these a little bit. So first of all, the gases consist of a large number of molecules, and the combined volume of the gas is small relative to the overall gas. In this image here, I think that's what it's trying to describe. This is a model in which we have a large number of gas particles, and their volume is small compared to the total volume. That was a static image, but in order to really understand the kinetic molecular theory, I think we need to begin to consider what does the particle motion look like. So I'm going to explore that within this FET simulation. Initial questions, let's begin to consider the motion of this ideal gas particle and analyze it. Is the motion straight or curved? And what happens when it strikes another particle or a wall? Attend to those two questions. And let's look at the model at the particle level. We'll add gas particles to our container. Observe their motion and observe what happens during the collisions. So as far as their motion, it always appeared to be moving in straight lines. I didn't observe any of them that was on an arced pathway. If I look at then the features of the kinetic molecular theory, this continuous random motion is taking place in straight lines. I don't think there are attractive or repulsive forces. The only time gas molecules are interacting is during a collision. There's no potential energy changing their path along the way. Now, when it 
a gas particle strikes another particle or a wall, the motion seemed to change then. There was a transfer of energy between the particles, or a force was being exerted when the particle struck the wall. The gas molecules are exerting no forces unless there is a collision. Energy can be transferred during these collisions, but the collisions are perfectly elastic, meaning energy is not lost along the way. And the pressure exerted by a gas, that's being caused by the collision of the gas when it's striking the walls of the container. Okay, I want you to make some predictions now. What will happen when heat is added or removed in this model? I want you to tell me about the particle motion, what the thermometer would read, and what the pressure gauge would read. We'll explore this within the simulation, but first of all, what are your predictions? When heat is being added or removed, what's going to happen to the particle motion, the temperature, the pressure? First of all, this is with heat being added. Consider the particle motion, the thermometer, and the pressure gauge. Heat being removed. And then taking it back to room temperature. In terms of tracking the motion, if you're watching that, if you were fixated on a particle, was your particle moving fast or slow? What happened during the particle motion? Or I should say, what happened to the particle motion as the temperature changed? I think a given particle was both fast and slow. It wasn't the case that we had particles that were always fast or always slow. It seemed it could be moving either fast or slow depending on the collision. Let's look at that again. Track a specific particle. It's easier to track a specific particle when the temperature is low. On the left hand side we can see what that means in terms of the kinetic energy and the speed with the two different histograms. As heat is added the temperature goes up I see both the kinetic energy and the speed distributions being shifted to higher values. The average kinetic energy of these particles, where the kinetic energy is one half mv squared, it increases when the temperature increases. When you're measuring the temperature, you are measuring this average kinetic energy of the particles as they're moving through space. Here's a figure from the book where it shows what the distribution of speeds look like at two different temperatures. I get a lot of insight from this FET sim because when I look at this image, this suggests some particles might always be moving fast and some particles always moving slow. But as I saw within the simulation, a given particle, it has any of these values. One moment it could be moving at a higher speed, the next after a collision after a slower speed, at a slower speed. But it's clear in both cases how the distribution is moving to a higher average speed as the temperature goes up. If we think about both the thermometer then and the pressure gauge, in this experiment the volume of the container was fixed. What if the experiment in the sim is repeated but the pressure is held constant instead? What do you predict then? Let's give that one a try. Let's test your prediction. I always like adding particles in here, so let's add particles. Temperature is about 300K. Pressure around 0.64 atmospheres. Let's make the pressure constant. 
and cool it down. Temperature is decreasing. In order to return to that same initial pressure, the volume had to get smaller. That was the only way that the force of those gas particles could once again equal the 0.6 atmospheres. Heat's added, temperature goes up. In order for the pressure to once again reach that value of around 0.6 atm, the volume has to increase, so they are striking the walls of the container less frequently. One other aspect to consider. Within that simulation, I was adding what were called heavy gas particles. What happens to the pressure when 60 light gas particles are added to the initial 60 heavy ones? What's your prediction? And tell me why. When 60 more particles are added, but they're light, do you think the total pressure will remain constant, increase a little, double, or triple? Within that static image, the temperature is at 300 K and the pressure is around 0.3 atmospheres. Here's the image when 60 light particles have also been added. The temperature remains at 300 K and the pressure has doubled. What's going on in this case? Let's consider these to be ideal, ideal gases. So let's say we use PV equals NRT for the heavy gas particles. We have a particular number of those that are exerting a pressure. Now in terms of the light particles, we can also consider those to be an ideal gas. If we use our PV equals NRT expression for those, we have a certain number of those particles, N sub 2, exerting a pressure. Combined, the total pressure is due to the total number of particles. Notice these values N sub 1, N sub 2, Nowhere in there does it say is it a light or heavy particle. Remember for our ideal gas equation, it's only the number of particles that is important. This idea of looking at the pressure for each set of particles independently and then adding them together, that's going to be very useful for us. The total pressure of the gas is the sum of these partial pressures. The pressure coming from one type of gas particle and the pressure coming from another type of gas particle. The total pressure only depends on the total number of gas particles, but we could think about it at least mentally in terms of dividing it up into the contribution that's coming from, let's say, the heavy particles and the lighter particles. So if one's considering the motion then of these light and heavy particles, do you predict there will be any difference? How will they be similar? How will they be different? Will they be different in any way? What are your thoughts when we're comparing these heavy and light gas particles using the kinetic molecular theory? Within this video, I've been playing around with the FET sim called Gas Properties. I think it's really helpful, and I've learned a lot by simply playing with it. Instead of giving you questions or problems that I'd like you to uh, seek to answer. My recommendation is go to the FET website, play with the simulation, see what you can learn.